This video clinic is over etude number 41 from Max Potag's book Preparatory Melodies for Solo Work. Number 41 is an interesting piece because it's a little bit more demanding than some of the others even though it is a more cantabile solo. One of the first things you notice is the meter. 4-8 time. So we are, use, we are needing to make sure that we understand that the eighth note gets the pulse. Therefore, if you have sixteenth notes, sixteenth notes are like eighth notes in 4-4 four, four time. Then when you have thirty seconds, thirty seconds are like sixteenths in 4-4 four, four time. So it's a little bit unusual for younger players to play in such a meter. However, as you get more advanced and into classical literature, it's not uncommon to see such meters like 4-8 and so forth like that. One of the things that this exercise is looking for, besides nice cantabile playing, is flexibility. You have several ascensions up above the staff, most notable to A's. Then on the second, end of the second, getting into the third line, you have all these fast leaps of a seventh or a sixth. And then you go down a couple more lines. You have fast arpeggio works, some flexibility. And then at the end, of the fifth line, he starts a sequence similar to what he has done before, but notice that you have two sets of 32nd notes, and those notes are a little bit problematic because some of the students that I've had in the past always want to play something else other than written. He's uh, set you up in a pattern, and then he changes it, and it doesn't seem to be exactly the way you think it should be. So be very careful on those. And then finally, at the very end, you have a nice arpeggiated flourish for the first three beats of the measure and you end on the upper F. Now let's take a few things at a time. First of all, one of the things that you're going to have to watch is that you have the same quality of sound when you ascend up to the upper note as when you do when you start lower. Often younger people have a tendency to bite or pinch the airstream and it gets an unsatisfactory sound and sometimes the sound doesn't come out at all. gets that nice, well it isn't nice at all, it gets that, gets that real ugly pinched sound. If we start whistling this pattern, we will automatically use the air correctly. If you can't whistle, even blowing an air pattern will give you the same idea. So if you, if you blow Now notice when you do that or even blow the air pattern notice what the tongue is doing. It's sort of helping you. Also if you hold your hand in front of your mouth and you whistle you'll notice that when you uh, whistle or end up on that upper note, you're going to find more velocity of air moving into your hand. When you whistle down, then you 
don't feel quite as much velocity air, but you do notice that you're using quite a lot of air. So the air is not necessarily being blown out, but it's more dense. Finally, if you look in a mirror when you do this, you're going to see that the opening in your lips really aren't changing. So it's all done with air direction and a little bit with the tongue inside where it moves a little bit more forward and a little bit more backward. Think about all the notes being on the same plane. This is a common occurrence in almost all my videos. Just so when you're going out of the back side of this in the first measure, when you're going out of the back side of the C, use a little bit more energy as you make the break. Another thing that you can do to help you is buzz on the mouthpiece. If you're pinching, you'll readily hear this. And if you're not using enough air or wind, then the entire process is going to be pitched. And that's going to give you an unsatisfactory sound. So think about blowing a good stream of wind out, allowing the lip to vibrate. Don't get the center of the lip too close together or too firm. You want the loudest unforced buzz. It's, it's air that is more like a sighing. You allow the lip to vibrate. Then when you play into the horn, you get a nice big resonant sound. Now, let's look at how we negotiate larger skips or leaps. Let's look at the second line. We have the C to the A. What I recommend is playing a C and then slowly hit every possible note going to the A. Okay, now we have our goal note. You can play that open, or you can play the A1 and 2. Then, once you hear, hit all those notes, then get a slow tempo and give a smear, a nice gliss over one beat. So you're going to have to really use the air to get up to that top note. Then, eighth notes. And then you sustain on one eighth note and gliss on the next. Then think of triplets. Sustain for two, gliss over one. Then, gliss over the last note of a sixteenth note, like one E and a, right, one E and gliss two, one E and gliss two. Yeah. Then, do it right on top of the note. That's why sometimes the one and two might not be a bad idea. So that as the fingers move down. That's when you make the adjustment. And the same thing on the D. If you need that. The same process would be at the end of that measure going from 
the G to the F. That's the trick about getting large slurs negotiated effortlessly. Now, let's look at that another problem passage on the next line down on line number four, those strings of 30 seconds at the last measure. <laughs> Into the chromatic leading up to the C on the next line. But getting into that is, is a little bit of a problem. Then you're going on like at the very beginning. Then, at the very end, last measure, after you hit the F on the downbeat, you can go ahead and use traditional fingerings, and it'll, it'll work. But your fingers really are doing a lot of moving. What I recommend is playing the rest of that measure on the B-flat horn, and then substitute your third finger for your one and two. So you're only really using the third valve when moving. So you have the A third, C, F, open, A third, then you go down. Now, let's hear what this is like when we put it all together. Before we listen to this in its entirety, I just remembered there is one other measure that is a little bit odd. If you look at the second line, third measure, you have a C, E, and then a B flat that E to B flat is a tritone, four and a half steps, and it's a little odd. What usually happens is that people will either, one, play a G instead of the E, or will overshoot the B flat. I got to really think about that. So, if you would consider using B flat horn on those two notes, the E and the B flat, E being the second finger, the notes, adjacent notes, are a little bit farther apart, so it's a little bit more stable and a little bit more accurate to hit. <laughs> And so getting into it, makes it a lot easier.
I believe those lines right there are the roughest passages in this piece. So be aware, I've shown you some ways to negotiate this, practice it slowly and carefully, then you pick out a tempo that to you feels easy to negotiate. It doesn't have to be really slow. It doesn't have to be really all that fast either. It's just a song. So nice and easy going and play with a very pretty sound. Let's hear what this is like in its entirety. 